And welcome back to this evening's program here. Thank you for joining us. Time now to join our live panel with our meteorologist and our special guest, Judge Ed Emmett. Thank Good you for be being here. here, Judge. Good to see you. A lot of questions from a lot of you folks, so we're going to get to that in just a minute. But first, Frank, you want to talk about the, not a disturbance, but something in the Gulf we ought to well, keep our minds some on. circulation off the coast of Louisiana, and it's certainly worth watching, and that's what we're going to do. I'll talk more about this at 10 o'clock. Take a, a quick look at some weather maps here, and you'll see I've highlight, highlighted this little area right there south of Louisiana. So if you look at that future cast, it doesn't do much as we go into Friday. There's just a lot of moisture out there, but you get a sense of that circulation, and look what happens as we move into Saturday, and then especially into Sunday. You really get a spin going. So a a late tropical depression. You know, Imelda wasn't declared a tropical storm until it moved inland. So that could happen with this storm too. It's over 86 degree water. All you need is 80 degrees. So that's there. Very low wind shear is in place and it's going to stay that way as we go into Friday and Saturday. So nothing's really going to tear it up. I think if you look at the checklist and I didn't put development likely, I just put possible. Mm -hmm. Warm water, low wind shear, no land interaction, deep moisture. We'll right. talk more about it at 10. We got a lot of questions from yeah. people. Christina from Meadows Place says it's already been August. We haven't even and seen a hurricane or a tropical storm. Why is that? Is it due to the dust from Africa? What are the circumstances? Why are we not seeing more in terms of hurricanes? And so Michael from Pasadena, Saharan dust always been moving across the Atlantic and we just have the technology to track and now we think that's why. Well, part of it is the dust. So the dust is playing a big role. There's also some fairly strong wind shear. However, it's a La Nina season, which means we're going to see weaker uh, wind shears move throughout the season and the temperatures of the ocean are going to be gangbuster warm. So that's all going for it. I heard an interesting thing Though when we were talking to Phil Kotzbach, when I was talking to Phil Kotzbach earlier this week, he's the big hurricane forecaster. He said the only way this season would be a bust, mm -hmm. he's like looking at the European heat wave. That European hot air has been moving into Africa, and so what it's doing, it's inhibiting a lot of those uh, tropical waves that move off the Afri African coastline. Typically, we get 50 to 60 a year that move through. He's like, that number's not there. We're not anywhere near that number. But he says, he still thinks it's going to be a busy season above average, and the big reason is La Nina, warm temperatures, low wind shear. He's like, just wait, we're headed that way. And right. that's one of the reasons the dust has been so active. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, they've been studying this dust since the mid-60s mm. uh, in earnest. And people say, well, where did this dust come from? Right. I'm not sure that we knew it played such a role tropically until... 20 years ago. Right. They were studying it for what does it do to the ocean? What does it do to the air? What does it do to the air quality? What does it do for fertilization of the Amazon? There are all these other reasons to look at the African dust. But when they started looking at the way it can inhibit hurricane development, that's when we sort of caught on to that. But it's been studied for a while. And I was going to say, that goes from a question that Michael in Pasadena has said, said. He said, if the dust has been here the whole time, are we just now able to sort of track it or we have better technology? Well, but I was going to say mid 60s, keep in mind, we didn't see any tropical development in the 70s and 80s because right. it was so cool. Right. The environment was cool, so I don't think it had much of a play. But then we started to warm up in the 90s mm -hmm. and the aughts, is that what we call them? The aughts and the 2010s, and then you, you factor that in a little more. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's always been there, though. And what's interesting about that, too, if you look, and we always say getting into August, this is when things really ramp up, right? And the statistics bear that out. In fact, check that out. That's where we are right now today. You know, if you go back to your mathematics, your statistics 101 class, that's a bell curve right there. And we're just getting into the higher part of that bell curve. And it doesn't take much. We know that that uh, hurricane that we just, we're about five years out from Hurricane Harvey now that was under your watch. And so that whole period of time, really devastating for us. Talk about what the challenge is and has been to recover from that even now. Well, b before I talk about the recovery, let's be clear. The rains of Harvey weren't a hurricane. It was the remnants of Hurricane Harvey that became this tropical storm that just sat on top of us. Hurricanes, uh, people are a little confused. You got to protect yourself from the storm surge, but it's not necessarily the rainfall that's the big problem. But any of these, even the one you were just talking about, right. in theory, once it gets over land, could just become a big rainstorm. Mm -hmm. Have there been improvements? Yes. I mean, clearly the, the, the Bray's watershed has been improved a great deal. Sims was already done before Harvey, which is why it was interesting. Harvey didn't create a lot of flooding along Sims Bayou. There's still a lot to be done. Why? Well, the, the two and a half billion dollar bond issue hadn't really been implemented fully yet. Some of that has been a little, shall we say, political discussion. Uh, there's been differences in terms of recovery. The general land office and the county and the city haven't been able to get on the same page all the time, and that, that's a problem. But it all comes down to public attention, too. 
you took a poll a year after Harvey, number one issue was flooding. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. COVID comes along. Yeah. The county leaders had to pay attention to COVID, no question. And the public started paying attention to COVID. And so by the time the next storm comes along, how, how much of the public is going to really be focused on the watersheds? And then they'll all go, well, why haven't you done anything? Yeah. But there is progress. It is going slower than perhaps some of us would have liked. And it would be nice if the politics wasn't taking a big part of it. Absolutely. There should be no politics in flood control. Yeah. It shouldn't be. Because it affects everyone. It does. Yeah. And it, it, but unfortunately, some of the funding mechanisms, peop, this is lost uh, on some, some of the funding mechanisms from the federal government are tied to the value of the property. Well, I'm sorry, that, that's not right. I mean, the fact that you have a higher value property shouldn't put you at the front of the line. Mm -hmm. But that's why some of the money in the bond issue was set aside specifically for the lower income areas. And, but I don't think Greens and Hall and th those watersheds have near enough has been done yet. What about Buffalo? Well, Buffalo Bio is, is constant. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's always under uh, uh, improvement. And, and there have been some things. But most of the bond issues, if you remember, were f for the wa other watersheds. Mm -hmm. And the reservoirs, the dams, still the, the reservoirs same? reservoirs are, are um, I won't say they're fine, but they're a lot, they're a lot better. And the Corps of Engineers knows what needs, needs to be done there. 